week's edition of Beat Beat. Welcome to this week's Meet Me with Laura Maris. Uh, we'll be talking about her translation of the plague. Um, this is Yes Week Cannibals, um, special salon series that's every Sunday from four to six. Upcoming on February 6th, we have Soul Lab Sundays, uh, the second iteration. And on February 13th, we have a really special meet meet with Robert Mann, who you may know from Jeff Landry's attacks on him. Um, he'll be here to talk about academic freedom and what it's like to be in the crosshairs of the Attorney General. Um, also, we have a new show in the gallery, Nothing, No Thing, um, which is open now. And we'll have a closing for it on February 25th from 7 to 9 p.m. It is the work of the co-founders, myself and Matt Keel. Uh, please come out and check it out. And finally, a huge thank you to our current Patreon members. And a plea that if you like this work and you want to support this work, you can do so by checking out our Patreon, where every uh, person who joins has entered into a raffle to win our work from each of our gallery shows. But uh, today, we're meeting with Laura Maris, who is in Buffalo, New York. She's a writer and a translator, and her work has appeared in such prestigious publications, the New York Times, the Yale Review, The Believer, The Point, and elsewhere. She recently translated Albert Camus' The Plague as one of her pandemic projects, um, and we'll be talking with her today about that. Some of her other translations include Geraldine Schwartz's Those Who Forget and To Live Is to Resist, as well as a biography of Antonio Gramsci. Um, she is currently at work on her first solo book, The Age of Loneliness. And she is a writer in residence at the University of Buffalo's Coalesce Center for Bio Art. Um, so without further ado, welcome, Laura. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. It's awesome to be here. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about the plague and show us your copy, which has the beautiful jacket since ours um, is missing yeah. the cover? <laughs> sure. Um, so this is what the new version of the plague looks like in my translation. Um, and this is actually, this is the first new translation of the plague for an American audience in about 70 years. Um, and it just came out this past November. And actually, as it happens, um, I was started to work on this project before COVID happened. Um, so I actually started working on it um, in the fall of 2019. And one of the last places that I went to do research for the project um, was the city of Oral in Algeria, where the novel takes place. And so that was pretty much the last place I went um, before COVID shut anything down and um, shut everything down. And then I ended up working on this book, um, working on the translation um, in quarantine um, in throughout 2020. So, um, yeah. And Do you feel like you're extra prepared? Because so much of this book is so prescient, which maybe you want to talk about how, you know, uh, perhaps the introductory quote and how it was not written uh, about a health-related emergency. Yeah, so for a long time, uh, the plague has been read as Camus. So it, it came out for the first time in French um, in 1947 in the immediate aftermath of World War II. And um, it was really read for a long time, both in school and people who read it independently, read it as an allegory of the Nazi occupation of France and as an allegory of Camus' work in the French resistance. Um, and so it hadn't really had much of a break from that reading tradition um, for a really long time until people in the last, I mean, and, and you know, it's not the only time, COVID's not the only time, um, that people have returned to this book. Um, they, people also return to it, you know, in previous epidemics. Um, 
But it really came to kind of a prominence during our current pandemic because people came back to it and, and found things in it that spoke to them, I think, in ways that were a little bit different from the ways that it had been traditionally read. Um, so there was a lot that was felt, I think, kind of fresh for people or almost like, you know, straight out of their own lives, like people walking the streets of the city, like without anywhere else to go or the psychology of the city in quarantine or the kind of surprise of like how, you know, a city can suddenly fall sick. Um, all these things, I think, were a little bit liberated from the original allegory um, in the new context that we're living in. One of the things that I found most impactful about, you know, thinking about his book in terms of the plague was this description of citizens in exile. Uh, and that certainly gave me a, a, a language for something that I maybe have had before. Um, and when you, was that when you had just moved to Buffalo or, or just after? Yeah, you know, it's it's super interesting because um I I was sort of aware that the plague was a potential translation project that was in the ether, you know, there were some plans in place for it to be retranslated, but no one knew like who would get to do the retranslation. <laughs> you know, so I was thinking about the plague quite a bit and it's a novel that I've always loved, so I was I was really hopeful that I would get the chance to like audition for this project. <laughs> and then um, when we first moved to Buffalo, the first week we were in our new house, um, I, I looked out the front door window and I saw a rat walk across our front steps. <laughs> and like, this would have horrified a lot of people, but I was sort of like, Oh, maybe that's an omen. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so it was, we were, we were in Buffalo for like a year and a half uh, before COVID began. Um, so fortunately, like I did get a chance to meet some people and <laughs> settle in a little bit here um, before the pandemic hit. But um, yeah, I, I think that I was really um, just, you know, not aware <laughs> as a lot of people are not like uh, that these things like massive pandemics, these things that have happened in the past, like they can happen to you as well. Um, and so somehow, like when I did begin to work on this book, um, I think that it, it gave me a sort of strange feeling of having been immersed in something that all of my friends and everyone I know was sort of like waking up to um, in 2020. But um, yeah, I'd been looking at, you know, I'd been, I'd been trying to translate these passages about quarantine for maybe six months um, when the pandemic started. And it, it made for some really strange moments where, you know, you're a little bit afraid of like the ink shadow that's on the next page. <laughs> like, you don't know <laughs> what information it's going to carry when you turn it. Yeah, he seems we're almost clairvoyant. Uh, you're reminding me that when I first began reading the book, I had this really vivid dream about snacking on mice and that this, uh, uh, this scene obviously penetrated my yeah. consciousness. Um, so it was yeah. a moment, I guess, because you did get the, uh, you yeah. did get the, uh, the gig. Well, so I have a question for you about this being more on which is, you know, he describes it in the first few pages as undeniably ugly. And so I'm very curious about your experiences having read the book and then visiting the city and what that was like. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's super interesting and it's, it's important to distinguish like the Oran that Camus was living in from present day Oran because the the Oran that Camus was experiencing was very much like Oran under French colonial occupation. Um, so, you know, there's something interesting about the allegory because Camus did set the book in a city that was also, you know, an occupied city. Um, Oran was at the time he was writing, you know, very much kind of occupied by the French settler presence. Um, but I think 
Yeah, just getting to visit the city. Um, and and for me, I got to work with this really cool organization there um, that's run by a man named Abdelham Abdelhak, who does like walking tours of the city. And um, he's, he's an expert in everything that... Um, it's kind of in the layers of history there. So you can ask him about a street or about a monument. Um, and some of the places that were there in Camus' time, um, like the, the cathedral, you know, and this in the central square of the city, um, they're there in these kind of transformed ways. So the, the cathedral structure is still there, but it's a, it's a library. So it's the public library. <laughs> um, so getting to, to go in there and um, to kind of layer the images that I would conjure to my mind with the images that Camus was actually seeing, um, I find really helpful as a translator um, because you're not just like working with the fabric of the text, you're working with the fabric of somebody else's imagination. <laughs> um, and in order to get that right, I think in order to try to like climb inside what they were seeing, um, it really helps to see the place. And um, for me, I really liked the opportunity to walk around the city, um, especially because so much of the book takes place like in the streets, walking, um, the sense of like distances when, you know, their gasoline is rationed, like people can't drive anymore. Um, there's a lot of time that takes place um, and in these streetscapes where you see how the pandemic or the, the epidemic in the novel is, is um, affecting everyone. And so in that scale of the streetscape, it was really cool to actually be in the city um, and to walk around. And um, yeah, then there are sites like the Plague Cemetery in Oral, which I don't think I would have found on my own, um, but which is a totally eerie place. Um, it's very deserted and there are these gates that, you know, no one's really sure who has the key to them. Um, so you're just like looking <laughs> through the bars um, and it's a place where there's quite a significant layering of um, different occupying forces who had come through Oran. So the plague cemetery is where um, a lot of French settlers are buried from the first cholera epidemic that they experienced there, but they built the cemetery on the outskirts of like an old Spanish fort. Um, so there's kind of like a labyrinth of tunnels from the fort that were used for defensive maneuvers that are underneath these graves of like cholera victims. So you get this sense of a place that, um, is just, you know, requires a lot of um, thinking through the different maps and what they signified to people who were there at the time. Um, so just being able to, to be there was really helpful and in, in kind of trying to conceive of all of that. What do you think Camus would have thought of his novel being read as an allegory that concerned colonialism? Yeah, it's a major question. Um, I think he he was a little bit, well, I can't, um, <laughs> despite what I said about trying to get inside his head, I don't, I don't know what he would have thought. He certainly writes about colonialism more directly in other pieces. Um, he has this short story that he writes later in his career um, called La Haute, which in French, it means the, La Haute can mean either the guest or the host. Um, so it's a very ambiguous story. And that one, I think, is probably the most direct allegory that he ever wrote that pertained to colonialism. Um, but in the plague, you know, it's really tricky because there's a whole spectrum of takes on, on um, what Camus was thinking about colonialism when he was working on the plague. Um, he was really isolated in France at the time that he was writing it. Um, so he began to work on it in Oran, but then his tuberculosis relapsed pretty severely. Um, so he, there, yeah, he was very ill <laughs> when he was working on the plague. Um, so while illness was like not very metaphorical to him at the time, um, 
it was also like something that separated him from Algeria. So he was sent for like a cure in the mountains in France. Um, and then the allies retook North Africa in Af operation torch. And so then Camus ended up cut off from, um, from Algeria for the remainder of the war. So he was actually in France when he was writing and um, he couldn't even like send a letter to his family. Like there was absolutely no communication between the two sides of the Mediterranean. Um, so I think for him, um, you know, he was very wrapped up in the allegory of World War II as the book was coming out. Um, and so the way he situates the, the plot of the story within, um, you know, a, a city under colonial control, um, it started to become a real thorn in his side and a question um, as, you know, the 1950s rolled around and, and Algeria came closer to independence. Um, and he went in, you know, he really went silent about it. Um, personally, I think that, you know, you can read the presence of Oran and the lack of Arabs in the novel, you know, you can read it. Um, and people have read it as, as a, I mean, it is a serious flaw in the book. Um, but, you know, there, there are critics who have argued that it's almost like, you know, on the one hand, um, a complete erasure, like a violence. And then on the other hand, there are critics who argue that um, it's, you know, a stylistic choice based on his trying to create like a, you know, an allegorical city where he can pick and choose what he contends with. But of course, you can never pick and choose what you contend with in the space of a novel. So, yeah, I think um, from my part, I see him as, as um, someone who wanted to write about a city he knew well in order to base um, an imaginative work within something concrete. Um, but, and he wanted to allegorize a war and, and a resistance that he was part of. Um, I don't think he was comfortable with the larger implications of setting it in oral that developed after the book came out. And I think in his discomfort, he, you know, said some things that really didn't help his case. One thing that struck me um, from our contemporary lens his focus on or the way he uses ecology to sort of describe mood and prefigure disaster and um, all these things that very much seem right for the moment that we are in uh, and i would love to hear your thoughts on his use of ecology and how that fits in with the existentialists in general yeah for sure um so it's really, I, I don't know if you remember it, but there's that moment in the novel when the first rat appears <laughs> and it's like comes out of this little corner of the hallway. And it's almost like a cartoonish image, the way he describes it, like spinning around and spitting out blood. <laughs> um, and I, I was thinking about that because it, it's like kind of an, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a, um, any, it doesn't feel realistic in any way, you know, it's not really like a realist novel. Um, but I was wondering where that came from. And it turns out that that image of the rat actually comes from a medical source. So there was um, a doctor working in um, like the 1890s who wrote a treatise about um, protecting against the plague. And in that, he says, you know, the rat comes out of its hole, it turns around, it spits blood and it perishes. <laughs> so Camus stole the verbs and the progression um, from a medical source. And I think that that's really intentional because there is like a real ecological component to the plague chronicle um, that people are struggling to understand an, an environmental cataclysm, you know, in the form of an epidemic. And each time an epidemic returns, it's like coming out of this um, reservoir that people don't really understand. And I think Camus really writes very movingly in the plague about how people can be going about their daily lives. You know, they're, 
when when Dr. Ryu in the novel first sees the plague rat, you know, he doesn't even think about the plague rat. He thinks about his wife who has tuberculosis. And, you know, that little spit of blood like reminds him of his wife. So he's full of human concerns. And um, I think that Kim does such a good job of dramatizing the way we're always looking to like anthropomorphize something or make it into a metaphor. And then turns out like we're so subsumed within the natural world, like it's already too late. Um, and so I think that more than a lot of writers at the time, um, he was keenly aware of like just how porous humans are with the natural world, like just how entangled we are with the places that we live in um, and the ecology of where we live. Um, and actually that, that rat image comes back um, later in the novel, when Kemu is describing the ocean um, in the swimming scene, there's like this moment when um, Dr. Ryu and Teru take a swim for friendship. And they're sort of in this moment of like getting out of the city and taking a break. Um, and they go down to the jetty and they jump in the water. And it's, it's sort of a scene that's a respite from the disease. But even in that scene, the way Kemu describes the sea it's like he says that it's like supple and sleek as velvet, um, like an animal. Um, the waves coming in have these kind of like oily glints. And that animal reference, it totally reminds you of the wet fur of the rat in the beginning. <laughs> um, and I really like that because, of course, you know, it's the ocean, the port um, that's bringing in the rats on ships like it's this kind of exchange with the rest of the world that's unavoidable and it's present even in a moment that you think is like a break from everything yeah i love also his dichotomy between the city which he describes as one without hints and how it's closed mm -hmm. off from its surroundings and he begins uh, the book with this description um I find that particularly kind of prescient. Also, the way they talk about shutting out the ecology of the place and how instead it bears down on them. Um, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's also really interesting because the there's like this idea that we're so familiar with now of like zoonoses, you know, like diseases that come that are exchanged between humans and animals and mutate, and and I think that. Um, Camus is also kind of capturing that cyclical nature of how things come back um, because he was somebody who had a, an illness that would be like latent in him and would relapse. Um, so he was also kind of in, involved like within his own body um, and his own immune system with the way that like you can think that everything's fine and, and everything is okay on the surface, but somewhere within you, there's like a latent illness hiding. And, and I think he, he dramatizes that up to the level of a city. Um, so he describes Oral as like a sick man whose blood suddenly, or a healthy man whose sick blood suddenly revolts, you know, it's like all of a sudden um, out of, you know, out of the woodwork comes all of this um, illness that was already there. And so I think that that's a much more interesting image for us now um, than, you know, some of the images of existentialism that were on offer at the time. Um, definitely Sartre gave Camus a lot of grief for, um, descri you know, for allegorizing the Nazis as a plague um, because he was like, well, of course, it's as if they came, you know, of course, the, the Nazis have agency, you know, they can't be described as a plague. Like, it's as if they're coming for no reason, leaving for no reason. Um, but I think that Camus has kind of been vindicated in describing the, the rise of tyranny and fascism like, like an illness that comes and recedes, um, that, pe that people have to sort of defend themselves against. <laughs> like, you're, you know, you're responsible for what's latent in you um and you have to notice <laughs> um when it starts to sicken you and if you don't then then that's a dangerous thing <laughs> yeah i mean so some of his central themes are the center play of habit worry and trust and who can you trust uh, he spends a great deal of the book describing bureaucracy and its inefficiency um, yeah and you know I guess 
I think a question for us today is, you know, we've automated so much of this cataloging, right? And it points to this as kind of a source that is completely ineffective at dealing with contagion, um, be it of a sort of intellectual kind or a zoonotic kind. And I wonder what your kind of thoughts on that are, how that can fly now, or how you see the, the lineage of that, basically. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about this the other day because, um, you know, thinking about Camus as someone who was really ill and unlike feverish um, throughout the whole time that he was writing this book. Um, and I was thinking about the way that during COVID, like countries at airports have instituted temperature checks um, and like the way, you know, you're like beeped and the, you know, the thermometer beeps when it's held up to your forehead, right? And <laughs> I had this strange sense of imagining what it would have been like for Camus to be a traveler during COVID and like how, you know, he, he would have been turned away, basically. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, the, the ideas of bureaucracy, I mean, he, he was someone who, um, not only the kind of separation from his wife and his family while he was working on this, um, was of course like a, a bureaucratic one caused by war, but, um, he was also someone who had really kind of suffered from bureaucracy <laughs> earlier in his life, um, because he was tubercular, he wasn't allowed to take um the the kind of teacher's exam um to become a philosophy teacher um and so he was cobbling together income from being a tutor and um you know after world war ii began he was teaching jewish students who weren't allowed to go to school um he was really kind of down on his luck when he began to write this um, and a lot of that was, I think, I think he was really keenly aware of how cruel bureaucracy is um, and all of the faces that it wears. You know, one of my favorite parts of the book is where he describes going to the different offices <laughs> of the bureaucrats and, and kind of giving each of them names. Like the, the classic bureaucrats are the ones who just tell you to go somewhere else. Like the, the, there's like the pass the buck bureaucrats who say that they, f you know, fill out a form for me and then I'll put it <laughs> on someone else's desk. Like, you know, there's the kind who sit you down and offer you tea and talk to you very kindly, but then don't do anything. <laughs> he really has the whole taxonomy of bureaucracy like out in the book. Um, and I think that that is, is something that, um, I think that that's something that is a little bit like overlooked in this novel. Um, the way that he, he dramatizes really intense um, social shifts and changes, you know, like people dying of a, of a sudden illness, but then he's also able to dramatize like the really small everyday cruelties that are kind of normalized through bureaucracy. Um, so he gets the whole scope um, of what can be happening in a city in quarantine. <laughs> Who do you think he most self-identified with of his characters? Because in hearing you describe this, you completely changed my opinion of who he, who I think he self-identified with. You know, I think he identifies with all of them. Um, there's a slice of him in each one. Um, he was definitely, you know, he he's a little bit like the the Doctor Ryu who's separated from his wife. Um, Although he transposes which one of them is ill. <laughs> um, in the novel, you know, it's Rhea's wife who has tuberculosis and is sent away to a sanitarium. But um, he's also a little bit like Ron Bear. You know, Camus was a, was a journalist and um, was trapped in a city far away <laughs> from his family, unable to go home. Um, there's some of him in the writer Grand who, who can't finish the first sentence of his novel. You know, he's like obsessionally revising it. <laughs> Um, I think Camus' anxieties as a writer really come out there. Um, there's definitely some of Camus and Taru, who is this sort of patron saint of the absurd <laughs> in the novel. Um, and, the, and, and Camus was certainly also um, 
uh, a strong and, and vocal opponent of the death penalty, as Teru is. Um, so there's some of Camus and Teru as well. Um, and yeah, I think um, the only people I, I don't see Camus identifying with are probably the priest and the magistrate. <laughs> Although he manages to empathize with both, but <laughs> um, yeah, there's there's a kind of refraction of a lot of Camus' different experiences into different characters in the book, and I think that's partly it's it's a way of like having things that are true to life and and that that have a kind of um, honesty to them, um, but that are not directly his own personal experience. Uh. Do you think that Camus would have thought that the Anthropocene is existential? <laughs> I think so, probably. I mean, I think that he, um, I mean, I, I think a lot about this line from The Stranger, um, where he talks about Merceau at the end of the book, um, when, you know, it's clear that, like, all bats are off and Merceau is going to die. Um, he He says... I'll throw myself upon the tender indifference of the world. <laughs> and that's a line that's been pretty sticky in my brain <laughs> lately. Um, I think that the tender indifference of the world, like there's this sense right in the Anthropocene that there's a little bit of like an existential problem um, where we're both talking about like the lifespan of our own species, right? How long we can hold out. <laughs> um, but then there's also this kind of existential question about what will happen to the earth itself. Um, and there's a sense that like the earth itself can evolve and change. Um, and, you know, whether it's like a snowball <laughs> or like, um, you know, a, a giant swamp at the Arctic, right? Um, that the earth itself will transform and, and be okay in its forms, you know, whatever that means. Um, whereas like humans might in engineer our own demise. Um, and I think that that sense that like, there is a kind of indifference of the world, um, that, that helped me understand, I think, some of the existential questions that come up in the Anthropocene. Um, but yeah, I, I think because Camus was so aware of his own mortality too, um, he, you know, he was diagnosed with tuberculosis when he was 17. Um, so he kind of had like this, this real vision of his own death living within him from a very young age. Um, and that created a philosophy of the absurd. That's, that's really just like, I hope um, I'm, I'm working and it's not okay to stop trying. <laughs> um, but I have no idea if this will work. And um, I was actually, I was talking to someone on Friday um, at the university of Washington. And he said that he had a student who described Camus philosophy as the effort is the hope. Um, and I think that's really a great summation of what Camus thought um, and Camus' idea of the absurd. You know, the effort is the hope. Like, we keep trying, even though we have no idea if this will work. And um, it's a great philosophy for the Anthropocene as well. Do you feel like, you know, because we're reading this in the present day, right? And so this uh, ecological cataclysm is the thing that we can't wrap our, our minds around. So do you, how do you feel that idea has aged or when you read this now, do you think that that's a powerful message that it can hold up to the idea of the Anthropocene? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I think that at the time Camus was writing, the idea that, that nature itself is a threat to humanity <laughs> or is like nature itself is ill. Um, you know, that there, there was such a divide between the natural and the human at the time that he was making this, um, that I think Camus was really, um, quite far ahead of the curve by, by writing something where, 
humans and natural forces are really deeply entangled. Um, and I, I think that his conception of, um, you know, it, everything, everything in the novel is kind of touched by human impacts. Um, the first thing he describes about Oran is that it's like a city that turns its back to the sea. <laughs> Um, it's a sunset, like you can, you can turn your back to the water, um, but you still are totally open to it. Um, and there's actually, there's another essay that he writes called, um, the Minotaur, which is about Oran, uh, the Minotaur or stopping in Oran is the, is the full name of it. Um, and he describes Oran in that essay as like a, a city that's caught in like a stone vice. <laughs> um, and he's looking down at Oran from the, the kind of hilltop above the city. And he describes the houses and the, the kind of whole setup of, of um, urban space in that essay as something that is completely dwarfed by these kind of crumbling cliff sides <laughs> and this stone vice that's holding the holding um the city in place and um going out to the harbor so he has a really um geological conception of of humans living <laughs> in oral um and i came to kind of when I went back to that, it, it surprised me and, and I, um, I, I liked reading about it because it did make me feel like the, like his sense of the place was, was one where you could feel, um, you could feel the sense that like the earth itself, um, could open <laughs> at any moment. Um, and yeah, I think, I think that does have something to say to us these days uh, about just how, how it's possible to feel vulnerable, even in a landscape that's like, quote unquote, um, humanized, or even in like, urban space, like there's this kind of uh, emptiness surrounding the city of Oran that it, it doesn't have, um, you know, its purchase is always a little bit fragile. Um, how well do you think that his plague maps to COVID? Yeah, um, it's interesting. I, I feel like it maps pretty strikingly, um, especially the parts about the separated lovers um, where he's talking about, you know, how people are, are trapped within their waiting. Um, and how hard it is to sustain relationships at a distance, um, how the kind of words that you use to communicate at a distance slowly empty of all of their meaning. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that the plague in Camus' novel lets up a little bit more easily than, um, our own has. I mean when I was working on some essays about the book um, with the collaborator, I was, we were kind of going back and forth and, and we finished a little volume of essays. And then um, when it came time to like, you know, write a note on the sources <laughs> or do the proofs or, you know, write like an introduction already, every time we came back to it, there was like a, um, a new wave or like a new, um mutation of the virus and so there's a way in which like the the plague in the novel is is a kind of classical narrative of of plague <laughs> where it comes it wreaks havoc goes away again <laughs> um there isn't you know and and in the novel certainly there's the sense that the plague could always return um but i think as covid continues like it becomes less and less easy to map the the um, more old fashioned kind of plague narrative onto our own pandemic. Um, I think, yeah, it, it will be interesting to see. I mean, I'm I'm super curious if you felt like the the book really 
mapped onto what you were or what you experienced or if you felt like by the time you were reading it now like it it felt almost quaint <laughs> i thought he was so prescient the way he describes the, the effect of religion how it captivates people in the beginning and they turn away from it here we have these yeah. people at uh, mega churches who in the early days of the pandemic were you know convening these giant um services i guess um uh, and and flaunting that and you know it's really that's kind of fallen off i haven't heard about that and i don't know how long uh, i also was really taken by this idea of exile that between mm -hmm. these holes of worry and trust you're sort of subsumed by habit and it takes you away from this this ability to realize that you don't feel this um that you feel an exile of your own time and place and yeah. especially since moved shortly before covid you know uh, that really made a lot of sense to me because even though we can commune this way that you and i are commuting now it certainly is um I can still relate to the inability to get the information out or to feel like it's been received. Um, the mm -hmm. characters play have. And I thought that he really kind of, he managed to touch on things that I would not have dreamed up living through the experience just as it began, you know? I mean, he knew that it would exacerbate inequality and he mentions that, but he really devotes a lot of time to to what it means to be in exile, to live through a pandemic, and to how this um, kind of manipulates the emotions of the individuals and then froths over. I mean, I thought he sort of predicted the January 6th attacks in one of the, the scenes yeah. in his book. Where, yeah. So I thought that was sort of incredible. But then I was really, um, I was really wondering about the choice to not reveal the narrator until the very end and in thinking about that in terms of this idea that everyone must um the effort is the hope as this student of your colleague described it right if that was a choice for that yeah but then i sort of as you were talking about his life i really see him in the figure of the writer who can't write um and mm -hmm. that being endemic to the pandemic um, as a, a creative person, you know, I was totally sapped. My creative energy was sapped by the pandemic, and that really resonates with me now in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, it's like, well, I feel like that that ties into the idea of exile too. You know, a lot of us felt really exiled from like our creative <laughs> practice, you know. Um, I used to write poetry. I haven't written a poem in a very long time. <laughs> like there's something about, the, yeah, not since the pandemic began. So there's something about this. Like, I, I think that, um, yeah, a lot of what you say really resonates. And I, I think the, um, the idea of predicting January 6th through the plague is super interesting. You mean with the riots, like in the, in the outskirts of the city? Yeah. Yeah, and the house burnings. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kind of collective excising of all their tensions and uh, boiling points being reached. Yeah, that was kind of tragic to me at the at the time that I was working on it because you know, it's it's true that the plague chronicles of the past like they do provide evidence that there have always during plagues been times when people resist all the restrictions that are designed to like try to keep other people healthy you know they buck all of the conventions for, of science right um but you know even Camus didn't imagine a world where like the leaders would aid and abet the people who are refusing to keep others safe um and that was kind of, I don't know, that, that I think is, it's totally in the book. You're absolutely right. But I feel like we're in a more cynical place, <laughs> even than Camus. <laughs> well, what I like about it is the, the pathos. I mean, he, he doesn't disidentify with these people, you know, and, and maybe we need a bit 
more of that, right? I mean, every even the figure of the criminal um, is is represent, represented as humane and, and mm -hmm. uh, with an inner life worthy of consideration, worthy of value. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, the character of Cotard, who's like this, you know, basically a, a black market. Um, he's basically a smuggler. <laughs> um, but during the plague in the early <laughs> days, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he's kind of, I mean, he's such an interesting character because he's, he's basically someone who would be prosecuted, but everyone's too busy with the plague to, to sort of deal with him for a while. <laughs> so he, he doesn't want to be, um, he doesn't want the plague to end because he knows when the plague ends, but that then, you know, they'll have time to take up his case again. And he'll probably be prosecuted. Um, so he's kind of Camus version of like a collaborator. Um, but you know, he, I, there's a really interesting conversation that he has with the doctor where Cotard's like, Hey doctor, like, you're not going to stop me. Like you're not going to turn me in. Um, you know, and, and I think Rhea and Taru ask him to help with like the public health squads and, and Cotard's like, no, 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 <laughs> that's against my interests. Like, I'm not going to do that. Um, but there's even a moment when like the doctor's like, well, just don't, you know, don't try to get other people sick. Like, you know, I, I'm not going to get involved with you um, hiding out from, from your own, you know, conviction through this pandemic, but I'm not going to, you know, but as long as you don't actively endanger people, um, it's sort of none of his business. Um, but I think that that's so, you know, it's kind of telling <laughs> that Cotard is one of the last scenes, his, his, one of his scenes is one of the last ones in the book. Um, and I don't want to spoil it, so I won't <laughs> see what happens. But um, yeah, there's yeah. There's kind of um, there's, there's a collision between the doctor's work and the work of the law um, in trying to keep people safe and healthy. Um, and yeah, there's a reason that the that Rhea is a doctor and not like a public health official, you know. Um, yeah, uh, who knows? Maybe Qatar's end will be prescient for us as well. Um, I'd love to end with something you mentioned when we were first talking, which is this idea of metaphors and illness. Um, and I don't know if that, that hinges into what you're working on now, and you'd like to take this as an opportunity to tell us a little bit about that as well. Um, yeah, well, it's, I think Camus is someone who, um, for me is, is like almost, um, like a, a bio artist avant la lettre, <laughs> like he's somebody who, um, was taking these metaphors of, illness and um and you know what's happening in the blood on an individual level and he was able to generalize that up to um create this kind of whole drama of a city um at one point you know he's talking about oral like like um the body of a person and um I think when he when he's making those uh, connections, it does really it does really feel like a very striking. Um, that has a lot in common with like contemporary bio artists um, and contemporary, you know, bio artists like Kathy High or people who are taking uh, metaphors from the cellular level and using them to make larger points about um, resistance and social consciousness. Um, and yeah, I think, I think immunity and resistance are really valuable metaphors, um, to this day, things that we can learn from, um, especially, you know, and ideas of like, if, you know, misinformation is circulating, right. How do we train ourselves to become, you know, to have like immune resistance to that? Um, or, you know, if we, if we feel, um, like, we've kind of 
lost control of the narrative. Like, how can we, um, how can we think about immunity um, within the larger context of like being good citizens? <laughs> um, and and Camus, I think, didn't he didn't expect the metaphors of immunity to be like a kind of social salve forever. Um, in fact, like quite the opposite, you know, I think he would welcome the way that um, people can think about resistance as like a constant thing, um, like something you build up over time, um, like a kind of like a, almost like the way your immune system creates like a memory in your blood of a pathogen you've encountered before and how that pathogen might come back um, to kind of and and like, you know, hopefully when the pathogen comes back, like when the, when the idea that's destructive comes back, like you've built up some kind of resistance within yourself um, to be able to fight that. <laughs> so, you know, these, I think, I think his metaphors are, can really speak to a lot of, of what's going on um, these days. Do, do you know what Camus thoughts on Dada were? You know, because if he's offering us these allegories, right, you know, where would be the place of paradox and what would he think about that? And yeah, you know, I don't know what he thought about Donna, <laughs> um, but it's a great question. I mean, I think a lot of people who have an affection for Camus' conception of the absurd, you know, this idea that like at any moment, um, you know, you could meet your death and yet you still have to go about all these money, mundane actions in your daily life. I and mean, that's kind of where, how Camus comes to the absurd. Um, and I think that, yeah, Dada is also something that, you know, uses pieces of everyday life to combat like a totalizing force. Um, and so there is something in common between those two <laughs> conceptions of absurdity, for sure. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess it, it leaves me thinking that if, you know, if his allegory is a way of defanging the provocative potential, you know, what, what would be more poignant, right? Because... Um, I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a way that by equating it with something older or knowing that he wrote this after World War II, or the ability to sort of pass it off, to, to put distance between the mm -hmm. things that seem so mirrored. Um, yeah. Well, he was... just, Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Please. No, please. No. <laughs> maybe that distance isn't productive anymore. Maybe it would have been more so. But now when we're sort of overwhelmed by an ability to put information, to give it context, you know, maybe it's losing that, that resonant power. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think allegory is kind of a challenging form um, these days. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, Camus also... You know, he he admired um, Melville's Moby Dick a lot <laughs> um, uh -huh. because it was so grounded in like all those chapters of like rope making and like how the whale, fa you know, how like the the fact basically, you know, the floating factory of the ship, like how it chops up the whales. Um, and he really admired Melville for creating um a, a kind of fictional plot that is grounded in that kind of intense reality. Um, and so I think that, you know, we were, you mentioned, you brought up briefly, like the idea of the narrator and like the, the we in the book, um, the narrator who conceals himself and, and until the very end. Um, I think that there's something in that too, about like this kind of discomfort with, creating um a chronicle story that like takes up um all of these other plague accounts like all of these other people's writing like all of their um you know all the basically he says like all of the, the materials that fell into his hands <laughs> um and yeah that that narrator in the plague um there's a kind of sense that that we is like it's an invitation to be part of the story of the allegory 
Um, and it's also an invitation to be like, nope, this is not my story. Like this is, I will read this we as like you, the citizens of this city, and I'm on the outside of the walls. <laughs> um, and so I think that that also can kind of tell us something about how, how stories that are narrated by a we um, are read in, in moments that are divisive. Um, like it's not always, um, I think, I think all authors who use a we, um, they're kind of throwing a gauntlet, <laughs> whether their readers are going to put themselves on the inside or the outside of that we. Um, and Camus is, is no exception, but I think in grounding his, his allegory in like these details of the city, he does, um, he does make a convincing case. Like he gives you something to hold on to that's more, um, more complicated than like the simple allegorical arc of a plague. Yeah, very much so. Um, I'd love for you to take us out by just telling us a little bit about what your next projects are and where you're going next. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry. That was the second half of your last question. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I'm working on a book of essays um, called the, the Age of Loneliness, um, which is it's each essay is devoted to a different landscape and looks at um, the ways in which both personal and ecological loneliness uh, overlap and inform each other in those landscapes. Um, so it takes its title from the naturalist E.O. Wilson, who um, he he kind of has this spurious argument. Um, it's a little bit of like a throwaway moment in his book, Half Earth, um, where he says that, like, if we're to continue in the Anthropocene as humans to um, make the world, you know, by, for and of ourselves, then we shouldn't call it the Anthropocene. We should call it the Eremocene which means the age of loneliness. <laughs> so this idea that humans are, are kind of making worlds in are making landscapes that are just by, for, and of ourselves is actually a way of making us lonely. Um, so I'm reading some landscapes through that lens. <laughs> Um, and yeah, and then there's also this book of essays on Camus and then reading the plague in a pandemic that's coming out. Um, yeah, this fall. Um, and that was a collaboration with Alice Kaplan. So if you're interested in more details on the city of Oran and all that stuff, um, it's called States of Plague. Yeah, please. You can, um, if you send us the link when we make the YouTube, we'll make sure and include that. Oh, cool. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Laura. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for sharing your insights. I didn't even get to ask you about the process of translation. Maybe when you return to talk about your um, book about ecological loneliness, which perhaps <laughs> well, 70 years from now we'll be reading back on as we are reading. <laughs> One can only hope, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Your questions were wonderful and um, it was really a pleasure to talk with you. And um, yeah, hope, hope you have a great rest of your night and um, hope to talk again soon. Yeah, we look forward to it.